Good evening and welcome everyone. I'm Allison Schilling, the Manager of Public Programs here at the Concord Museum, and I'm pleased to welcome you to this evening's forum offered as part of this year's Concord Festival of Authors. Our speaker this evening, Frederick Logoval, is the Lawrence D. Belfair Professor of International Affairs and Professor of History at Harvard University, and the author of JFK Coming of Age in the American Century, 1917 to 1956. Professor Logoval's previous book, Embers of War, The Fall of an Empire and the Making of America's Vietnam, won the Francis Parkman Prize and the 2013 Pulitzer Prize in History. In awarding this honor, the Pulitzer Committee described the volume as a balanced, deeply researched history of how as French colonial rule faltered, a succession of American leaders moved step-by-step step down a road towards full-blown war. One of those leaders, of course, was President John F. Kennedy and Professor Logoval opens Embers of War with the image of a brilliantly sunny autumn day in October 1951, when a pale, thin, and sickly 34-year-old congressman arrives on a fact-finding mission with his siblings, Robert and Patricia. Dodging gunfire during their short visit, John Kennedy peppers American journalists with penetrating questions to learn that the French are losing the war against Ho Chi Minh and that the United States is becoming colonialists in the eyes of the Vietnamese people. Upon his return home in an address to Boston Chamber of Commerce, JFK paints a gloomy portrait suggesting the American government has allied itself to the desperate efforts of the French regime and to hang on the remnants of an empire. Yet despite this awareness and the general anti-colonial position he stakes out in the United States Congress and Senate, within 10 years, Kennedy himself would be the president and, the, and presiding over a significant buildup of US military advisors and what the Vietnamese would come to call the American War. To better understand what drove JFK to take that eventful trip and other world tours to burnish his foreign policy credentials and to claim over the span of the 1950s, the mantle of leadership of the Democratic Party, we are fortunate to have Professor Logoval's magisterial new biography of John Kennedy, which recounts not only his coming of age from 1917 until 1956, when he decides to run for president, but also the story of the rise of the United States to a world superpower during increasingly turbulent times. Professor Logoval first met this evening's moderator, Tom Putnam, the Edward W. Kane Executive Director of the Concord Museum, when Tom was the director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum, where much of Professor Logoval's research was conducted. It was also during Tom's tenure that the library launched the nation's first ever digital archive of presidential papers, which included every sheet of paper in every box digitized sequentially for targeted collections, such as the presidential office files, which includes all of the documents that were touched by JFK during his presidency, including his speech drafts with edits and marginalia. As always, we thank everyone who has tuned in to watch tonight's program. If you wish to submit a question during the discussion, please do so in the chat on YouTube, and I will relay your questions to Tom. This new biography is available online and in person at the Concord Bookshop. We hope you will consider joining us again tomorrow night. We will turn back the calendar about 250 years for an in-depth look at the muskets in the Concord Museum's collection with our curator, David Wood, and Revolutionary War expert, Joel Boyd. And tune in next Wednesday evening for a forum on New England stone walls with University of Connecticut professor Robert Thorson, which we are offering in conjunction with our new temporary exhibit, Home Paintings by Lauren Coleman. And a reminder, if you enjoyed tonight's forum, we welcome your financial contributions, which help us to continue to bring award-winning historians like Professor Logoval to your homes. And thank you to everyone who already donated for tonight. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy this evening's program. Thanks, Alison, and uh, thank you, Fred, for joining us uh, tonight. Um, 
is uh, I, I want to first and foremost just praise the book. I so enjoyed reading it over the past couple of weeks and recommend it highly to all of our viewers. Um, as Allison mentioned, and as you well know, I spent about 20 years at the Kennedy Library. And since I oversaw the forum program there, uh, I really made it my um, kind of obligation to read every book uh, of the authors who came by uh, and spoke at the library. And I remember uh, uh, one, one day my 12 year old son came into the living room and saw me curled up uh, with uh, yet another biography. And he looked at me and simply said, don't you ever get tired of that guy? Um, and uh, I listened to your uh, recent conversation with George Packer and Chris Lydon and appreciated Chris's suggestion that reading this book is like being enticed by an old flame. Um, and uh, perhaps a less uh, uh, <laughs> pleasant memory. So I was reading it the other night, uh, putting myself to sleep and uh, my wife Phyllis looked over and uh, quipped, she said, I thought we'd agreed that you weren't gonna bring that guy to bed anymore. So uh, anyway, I am, uh, uh, I've, I've got away in this uh, setting now for a couple of years uh, doing forums from Paul Revere to Longfellow to Abraham Lincoln. And I often hide behind um, the facade that, that, that those errors in history are totally new to me. It's, so it's fun to be here and to learn about them. Uh, but I feel a slight danger tonight because you know, this is my home turf uh, and I am happy to kind of uh, revisit it uh, with you. Um, uh, when I read Embers of War, which again, I'll also promote, I mean, I really loved this book. I didn't read it until I uh, met you and, uh, you know, every page was something new. Um, whereas in the Kennedy book, I know the terrain, but there was so much that was fresh uh, to me. And that's really what I want to focus on. Um, with you tonight. I, I know you and I have spoken that uh, on the 50th anniversary of, uh, I think it was of JFK's assassination, Jill Abramson, who was then uh, editor of the New York Times, uh, wrote a long piece about why was there no definitive biography of JFK? And uh, I mean, you clearly have written it. You have filled that void and we are fortunate um, for it. And again, it's not just JFK, but as Allison mentioned, it's really uh, uh, his coming of age in the American century. And I hope we can uh, talk about that uh, a little bit more tonight. So uh, it's often easy um, to make connections in Concord to you know, history broad and wide. And we do have one here. And I thought we'd start there, which is that uh, JFK's mother, Rose, um, actually lived here in town for six years when she was seven to 13. Uh, and is obviously therefore his grandfather, Honey Fitz, uh, courted his uh, uh, sweetheart Josie, who lived nearby in Acton, and uh, and it, I think it was because Josie wanted to live here while their family was growing. Uh, one pictures Honey Fitz being a bit of a fish out of water living here in rural Concord. But let's start with um, Rose Kennedy. I thought what I might do is talk about a number of the characters. We understand JFK uh, through his relationship with his mother. So uh, you paint a kind of uh, an interesting, nuanced portrait of. Uh, Rose Kennedy, maybe we'll start uh, start there with her. Yeah. Um, well, let me just say, Tom, uh, that I'm just grateful to be with you. I want to I want to second the point about the uh, the digitizing of the Kennedy Library materials and also your leadership of the library. But as I said to you before we came on the air, uh, the opportunity that my students have and countless other people especially now in a time of COVID, which I dare say you could not have anticipated when you oversaw that work. It's fabulous that one can sit and see um, a sizable portion of the collection. And I'll just mention that um, Kennedy's papers from Harvard, for example, just one small example, and his senior thesis from Harvard, right there at the click of a, click of a mouse. And so I'm just grateful for that. Um, yeah, with Rose, I mean, we should talk about this. I, I, I do think that um, so much attention, Tom, is paid to Joe, Joe Kennedy Sr. And for good reason. He's such a, an overpowering figure. He is so dominant in the family. It was said by several of the kids, including Eunice, that when dad is around, mother kind of recedes. Um, and I think that's a powerful image. And I think there's truth in that. It's also the case that I think Rose was very influential in young 
young Jack's life, as I think any mother would be. But in particular, I think she maybe doesn't get enough credit for instilling in, in him a, a love of history, an interest in books, um, I think a love of politics. For all of Joe Kennedy's own presidential aspirations, I don't think he loved politics. Uh, politicking, campaigns, rallies. He didn't love that part of it in the way that his wife did. Uh, Honey Fitz, of course, her father, who you mentioned, had that love. I think he passed it on to her. And even though Jack Kennedy became a very different politician from his grandfather, he had that love too. And that comes from his mom. Uh, I'll just uh, mention uh, Doris Prince Goodwin writes about the uh, time when uh, Rose was living here in town and partly it was living here in Concord that um, uh, you know, helped encourage her own love of history and, and yeah, they would take that's a right. horse and carriage into uh, town to go to mass. And then she'd walk around Sleepy Hollow Cemetery and visit the graves yeah. of Thoreau and Alcott. Uh, and you paint, a, uh, I mean, JFK says, um, you know, mother was a little removed and still is, which I think is yeah. the only way to survive when you have nine children. Um, yeah. uh, but then later in your book, you know, she really does come through in those early statewide campaigns oh. because she was trained by her father and she knows how to campaign and she campaigns well and effectively for JFK. Oh, she's she's incredible by all accounts. I mean, the oral histories are, are, are you know, in unison, uh, so many of them in saying that she was a superb campaigner, that she might be kind of frosty, you know, one on one. Um, but she really came alive and she knew how to do it. Um, she would have sometimes prepared speeches, but she would often not need them because right. she was so good at doing this. And I think she was a real asset in his, as you say, in his early campaigns, the whole family was, but maybe, um, well, I suppose Joe's checkbook, uh, the, 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 the finances were maybe <laughs> most important. Hurt. <laughs> but I would say, apart from that, uh, if you talk about family influence, then I think Rose is critical. When we get to 52, then, of course, Bobby's role in the campaign is, is really right. important. But, yeah. yeah, no, she's she's vital, no question. And, and again, she learns that in the arm of her father because her mother didn't like to campaign. So she goes out with Honey Fitz when she's a yeah. teenager, really, and becomes his uh, kind of confidant. Uh, and let's just talk about him. His politics is a very different kind. JFK talks about that and that interesting conversation um, right before he runs for the presidency that, you know, JFK says, I'm the kind of guy who, who would rather read a book in an airplane than talk to the guy next to me. But his grandfather was, you know, never met an Irish tavern he didn't like, would go to an Irish wake every, would be out singing Sweet Adeline. He was kind of the old school backslapping Irish politician, JFK appreciated that about him. I think, I think he did. I think, uh, I think they were very different. Uh, and, uh, you know, you saw that even in the 46 campaign, his first campaign, he's just back from the war. He is a skinny 29 year old, doesn't quite know what he's doing. He's not very comfortable. There's a certain shyness or sh a kind of shy reserve that I think Jack Kennedy had that his grandfather most certainly did not have. So they were very different. Yeah. But I think devoted to each other, uh, and of course he became a, a, a you know a champion of Jack in these campaigns until he until he passed. Dave Powers tells that wonderful story. I don't know if it was in Charlestown, but JFK is speaking to a group of women, and um, it's not really going very well. And then at the end, uh, you know, he lost his brother in the war, and if you yeah. lost a, a, a son in the war, you were a gold star parent. And and he says, well, I had a gold star mother too, and I and and. Dave Power says that just it, the room changed. You know, they just immediately, you know, fell in love with this guy who was able to connect with them emotionally in that way. Yeah, I think that's very important, and I think that it was especially evident. I think in forty in the forty six campaign that 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 female voters, uh, women in these audiences, uh, were drawn to this in part because of this story, um, uh, and I think also his. You know, what he was initially reluctant to do in 46 right. was to talk very much about his own wartime experience. But I think Powers and others, including his father, said, no, this is too good. PT-109 is too good for you not to use. Okay. And so I think somewhat reluctantly he began to use it. And of course, it, it, uh, it paid dividends both then and later.
So let's switch to his father because it's an important part of the book, an important part of his yeah. development. And, uh, and let's use that word that you just used, kind of that social intelligence. You write, uh, Joseph P. Kennedy lacked the successful, he was a failure in the end as a diplomat uh, when he was our ambassador to England. Uh, because he, you say um, he lacked the skill at discretion, he didn't have a sense of history, he didn't have a subtle understanding of people and their motivation, he lacked a feel for the abstractions of world politics, he was cynical and pessimistic, you know, he really, he, he, he was everything his, his son was not. Um, yeah. So first, just talk about uh, why uh, Joseph P. Kennedy, I mean, he comes out in your book looking very positively as a father, but in terms of his public career, he fails as our ambassador to England uh, in the lead up to the war. Yeah, I mean, I found this, Tom, to be a totally fascinating part of the story to, to study. I don't know that I anticipated when I started writing that I would devote quite as much attention as I did to this period of Joe Kennedy's ambassadorship. One reason I did so is because I think it's important in terms of the effective end of Joe Kennedy's own political aspirations. He hoped potentially to be the 1940 Democratic nominee for president if FDR decided not to run for a third term. I think that was probably a long shot in any case, but he had those aspirations. And the ambassadorship, as you say, kills those chances. Um, and so I wanted to look at it partly for that reason, but also this is the same period in which Jack Kennedy proves willing in a way that his older brother is not, Joe Jr., to distance himself from his father, mm -hmm. to begin to say, especially in 3940, after the war begins, but before US entry, begins to say, maybe isolationism, as preached by my father and my older brother, maybe it's untenable. Um, and maybe it's the case that the United States will have to, at the very least, aid the British and the French and possibly even enter the war. This is maybe now more 41 that he's beginning to do this, but before Pearl Harbor, and his father both then and later refuses. And so I think, I think Joe Kennedy is, um, he's a complex figure. He's a devoted, in many respects, I think a marvelous father. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, in terms of his public career, uh, it's no surprise to me that it crashes and burns the way it mm -hmm. does during this ambassadorship. Well, and it's partly the combination of that, you write about this, that. Uh, what he, what's admirable about him as a father is he's so protective of his children and he yeah. views the war as risking his own children's yeah. life. And, uh, but it goes back, I was interested in first you, were, these are your words, Joseph Kennedy looked at war very much from a financial and material viewpoint. Uh, and what he saw was often not in his financial or personal interest. But what was new to me was, you know, at the beginning of World War I, he's with some Harvard friends. Yeah. Uh, they're talking about the Battle of the Somme. They're kind of celebrating it. And, um, you know, he says these attitudes are strange and incomprehensible. Uh, how can we celebrate thousands of young men about to be mowed down, their lives barely begun, cut off from their parents? Um, and then later, he's speaking in Aberdeen, Scotland, in the build-up to World War II. And he similarly challenges those, saying, you know, who have, you know, who of you are willing to give up your lives, well, you know, give up your children's lives uh, to prevent the spread of uh, fascism? Because he's mortally fearful that he will lose one of his sons to war. And then, of course, uh, tragically, he does. He does. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, I think it's a very powerful uh, um, worldview that he adopts. Uh, and as you say, it goes back to World War I. And I, I suggest in the book that there's power in Joe Kennedy's arguments mm -hmm. about these European battles over which tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of lives are lost in the mud uh, to gain, you know, a few miles. Uh, and I think he said, this is absurd. What is happening? He carries that through. It becomes a harder argument, I think, for most people, myself included, to sustain when we get into 3940. But, you know, I note, and I think we should remember, that an awful lot of Americans in 38, in 39, in 40, uh, adhered to his position. One of the things that surprised me, Tom, that I, <coughs> excuse me, didn't anticipate in my research was the degree to which the Harvard student body yeah. Uh, accepted, seconded Joe Kennedy's views. 
uh, overwhelming majority uh, of undergraduates in 39 and 40 basically said, we should keep the heck out of this thing. We shouldn't even really aid the British and the French. That surprised me. But I do want to just underscore here that, because um, we shouldn't lose sight of this, the devotion to his nine children. I mean, here's a guy who in 34 and 35, when he's heading sizable government agencies in Washington during the Depression, still finds time to write these long letters to his children, even though he's heading up these government agencies. It's, right. That part of him is quite remarkable. And, and again, you could picture him having a favorite child who he writes to more often, but he seems to be pretty, you know, equanimous. He, all right. the way down to little Teddy. I mean, yeah. maybe not quite then, but certainly in the right, years right, to come, yeah. Teddy will yeah. get these letters too. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about uh, Harvard because it's a pivotal moment. And let's, and, and let's talk about it in the context of JFK becomes a, an internationalist. Um, you know, he separates from his father. Although he, again, new to me that he had written an editorial early on in his Harvard years that began to kind of parrot his father's um, isolationist yeah, yeah. views, but then he, then he shifts. Um, so how do you explain that shift, which is really so powerful in his career? Well, I, you know, it's a really good question. I think it's in part um, interactions with his professors. The professors at Harvard were more uh, internationalist, more interventionist than were the students. And so I think JFK is he's affected as we tend to be, or as we often are by what our faculty members, our professors have to say. So there's partly that. I think it's partly his long standing interest in history. He was sick a lot as a child, read a lot of history. He's reading Winston Churchill, for example, while he's in prep school and uh, is immersed in European statecraft. And I think he understands in a way his father never does that at some point a people uh, a nation may decide that even if the odds against them are long, they have to fight. And I think he comes to believe, Jack does, that the, the British are in that position, certainly by 1940, I think he believes this. And then the final thing I would say here, Tom, is that his travels during his Harvard years, after uh, in 1937 with his good friend Lem Billings, maybe more importantly in 39, right up right up to the time of war, I think make a big impression on him. He sees up close that uh, conflict is in the offing. He's in, he's in Nazi Germany right before the war breaks out. I think that affects him as well. Yeah. I mean, it really is incredible who he's meeting with. And, yeah. you know, his father just gives him entree into, mm -hmm. um, I mean, at one point, George Kennan says, why, you know, why are we having to deal with this guy? You know, like, <laughs> he's just wasting our time. But the dis you write the dispatches he writes back to his father or as thoughtful as any career diplomat would have written. That it, it, you know, really I, I think so. May, they, may, they may lack some of the obviously in-depth knowledge, but in terms of being perceptive, having a sense of the complexity of the situation. Yeah, I think they're a kind of junior version of what you would expect from a seasoned journalist or a diplomat. Uh, this is just somewhat repeating what you just said, but I thought it was so beautifully written in your book. You write his pronounced international sensibility about his pronounced international sensibility. He was from the start a man of the world, deeply inquisitive about other political systems and cultures, comfortable with competing conceptions of national interests, this was partly an outgrowth of his Irish heritage and the sensibility of his parents, in particular, his mother who looked outward beyond the nation's shores. Um, yeah. And then let's, let's pause know. about uh, Winston Churchill because uh, his father doesn't admire Churchill at all. You know, they yeah. don't get along. And his father obviously is more with Chamberlain and, and appeasement. Um, but he also, he doesn't even, the father doesn't even represent the beauty of Churchill's language, which is what, yeah. you know, JFK understands these cadences and you yeah. write yeah. later that Sorensen helps to capture those when JFK becomes a public figure himself. But talk a little bit about Winston Churchill. Yeah, I mean, I think this is an interesting sort of, um, uh, what should I say, sub theme of the book that he encounters Churchill's writings as a kind of historian, um, including his multi-volume history of World War One. I'm not sure many, 12, 13 year olds would, would want to be, you know, reading multi-volume histories, massive multi-volume histories of the first world, world war, but uh, Jack Kennedy is one of them. So he has this. And then when Churchill becomes uh, a candidate for the prime ministership, 
then becomes in the spring of 1940 at a, at a key moment, just as France is under attack, becomes prime minister, I think uh, Jack Kennedy is poised to, to really uh, follow this man. He pays close attention to his oratory and his writing. I think he understands the romantic sort of conception of history that Churchill has. I think he aspires to have that a little bit himself. And his father doesn't get it. He does not understand the appeal of Churchill. He doesn't trust Churchill. He thinks Churchill is a, a drunk and somebody who can't be depended upon, whose word can't be trusted. Uh, JFK does not feel that way. And then later on, as you say, as a, as a senator, he listens to Churchill's recordings of Churchill's speeches and says to Ted Sorensen, we got we to gotta learn from this guy. I need to learn from this guy. And that's... That's interesting too. You include this quote of Churchill's, which again, it still gives you chills to hear the, you can hear it in Churchill's voice, but uh, you know, Churchill was, um, well, JFK was admiring Churchill who was and praising him for invoking Britain's national purpose and resolve curled in World War II an effort quote, to establish on impregnable rocks, the rights of the individual. We look forward to the day surely and confidently when our liberties and rights will be restored to us and while we shouldn't be able to share them with the peoples to whom such blessings are unknown. Oh man, I just, I gotta tell you that uh, I have quite a lot of Churchill quotes in the book and I got, I got chills when I was, yeah. when I was typing them in and I could have done, I could have had more of them. It's, 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 it's an unbelievable gift that he had. Uh, the interesting and quote and, uh, on this one, and we'll have to hold it for later in the discussion is, share them with peoples to whom such blessings are unknown yeah. as a very colonial statement, which obviously yeah. gets both Churchill and perhaps later JFK in some trouble. This um, is true. Focus on this moment, you know, uh, maybe just give us the background of the, the British line, um, the SS Athenia, uh, what happens there and, yeah. and why we get a little insight into JFK as a public figure at a very young age. Yeah, I mean, this is right after the war begins. Uh, it's a very dramatic moment. Uh, it's it's within hours of the British declaration of war. Um, Jack Kennedy is still in London, as is the rest of the family. Uh, and Chamberlain has just announced to the British people that Britain is now at war. And his, his, his attempt to head off the war has failed. And he's depressed about it, of course. Joe Kennedy is beside himself with, with yeah. despair at the fact that the war has now begun. And then uh, that night, uh, there is word that reaches the ambassador, Joe Kennedy, of a sinking uh, of the Athenia uh, liner. And an untold number of people are missing and are presumed to be dead. He sends young Jack Kennedy, because he, he could not spare anybody from the embassy, because everybody is now fully occupied with the fact that war has begun. So the only person he feels he can send is, is young Jack, who's on his way back to Harvard uh, for his senior year. So he's a college student. And Jack, because it's his first real exposure to as a, as a kind of public figure, he is, um, he is sent off to, to, to Scotland uh, and to, to meet with American survivors who give him a very hard time. Uh, they demand a convoy, a convoy to be escorted back to the United States. They want to understand what happened. How could this be allowed to happen, et cetera. And, you know, I'm, I'm persuaded by the newspaper accounts and the other evidence that we have that this 23-year-old is able um, to, 22-year-old, sorry, is able to parry. He's able to respond to, to, to these accusations and to this criticism in a way that wins him ultimately praise, I think, certainly from the Scottish authorities, but also from some of these Americans. It's a little insight into his preparation for later public office. I suggest that nobody since John Quincy Adams had the kind of preparation that Jack Kennedy had, and some of it happens right here in 1939. Uh, I'll quote from those newspaper accounts. Uh, that uh, praised him for showing a boyish charm, natural kindness, wisdom, and sympathy of a man twice his age to the London Evening News. He visited hospitals and was deemed an ambassador of mercy. Um, yeah. So I'm only gonna ask one question on this topic because the boyish charm has a darker side to it uh, yeah. as well. And I'm well-trained as a former 
federal employee and kind of a keeper of the flame to stay away from these prurient questions. But uh, you certainly don't hold back um, in covering this territory in the book. Uh, but it's interesting intellectually, um, you know, you suggest where JFK uh, is independent from his father and his father's isolationism. Unfortunately, he follows uh, his father's suit in more private affairs. And maybe, maybe yeah. you can comment on that. Yeah, it's true. Uh, you know, I, I, one of the themes in the book, and I lay it out in the preface, is that he was his own master that when it came to his uh, career choice, even though his father encouraged him in very strong terms to run for office, I think it was Jack himself who very much wanted to do this. We can discuss that. In terms of his worldview, as we've discussed, his, his, his view on foreign policy and what should be the US role, he is his own person. person. When it comes to campaign strategy, first as a House candidate and then a Senate candidate and then a presidential candidate, it's Jack's view that prevails, not his father's. But when it comes to um, how they treated women and to the womanizing, um, he is his father's son. Uh, I think Joe Kennedy made very clear both to Joe Jr. and to Jack what he expected them to do, how he expected them to behave. Uh, he basically said to them in so many words that women should be viewed as objects to be conquered. Um, that wasn't always the case with JFK. Uh, and there were certain um, girlfriends that he had. And then of course, ultimately Jackie, who I think he saw differently, but even with Jackie, as we know, he cheated on her before the wedding, he cheated on her after the wedding. Uh, and so, you know, I, I said recently, I don't think this is in the book, but I said, Tom, that he's a guy who showed a capacity for empathy, partly because he had been sick a lot as a child uh, partly because of the tragedies he suffered, losing Joe Jr., losing Kathleen, uh, his, his closest siblings in terms of relationship, effectively losing Rosemary in 1941 uh, to a kind of botched lobotomy. He had a, ca a capacity for empathy in a cognitive sense. He could put himself in other people's shoes, proved very important, by the way, at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis, which I'll deal with in volume two, so a cognitive empathy, but not an emotional empathy. That's where it's something seemed to lack on this question, at least. And that's something for volume two also that I'm going to have to grapple with. Um, uh, right. You know, it, right. it becomes, it continues to be an issue. Right. And, and again, I, it's, I never liked the pop psychology too much, but, you know, both, both parents really kind of uh, falter a little bit on emotional empathy. Yeah, um, you know, uh, I think that's right. Lives. I think that's right. Uh, so let's uh, return to more high-minded topics. I mean, in some ways, the central question of JFK's life really is the notion of whether democracies can survive in the 20th century and beyond. Uh, yeah. Can popular rule lend itself to effective foreign policy? Can democracies geared for a time of peace respond effectively to a time of war? So. I don't want to go over the whole uh, PT109 story too much, except to ask you, what, what are the lessons that you think uh, he learns from his own war, wartime experience? I guess, I guess I would say two things in particular from his period in the Solomons, his experience in the South Pacific, two things in particular. The first is I think he comes away from that experience, though he's proud of it. Uh, and he feels confident by the end that the United States will win the Pacific War and probably will prevail in Europe as well. Nevertheless, I think he comes away with a skepticism about the military instrument uh, being used to solve political problems that I think he carries with him really to the end of his days. So that's one one thing that I would single out, I suppose, Tom. The second is, I think he comes out of uh, the South Pacific. He returns to the United States in early 1944, convinced that the United States must play a leadership role. Whenever this thing ends, he says to his friends and others, whenever this thing ends, the U.S. is going to have to be deeply engaged as a leader uh, in, in, in world affairs. It cannot repeat its... Uh, it's, it's reaction to the end of the First World War. That, I think, is also something that stays with him. So, I mean, there are other things we could talk about here, but I would uh, single out yeah, those two um, things. Yeah, uh, 
And uh, uh, first, we're about halfway through, so remind viewers if you have questions to uh, submit them through the chat feature um, on the U our YouTube channel. Um, well, I thought I would uh, give the old joke about, uh, I mean, the funny story about the skepticism of the military. Um, and that's when, during the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, when uh, uh, you know, a, a U.S. flyer, um, U.S. plane mistakenly flies into the Soviet territory, doesn't mean to, just gets off track, and the Soviets think, you know, this could be a, uh, mm -hmm. a JFK's famous quip was, "There's always some damn fool that doesn't get the message." Um, both showing a certain kind of cool detachment. Uh, yeah. But also he, he just, when, when he got advice from the military later in life, he knew that things don't always work the way, um, you know, you expect them to. Um, That's right. I appreciate it in the book, you compare him with Ben Bradley uh, and others have talked about, you know, these folks who had, um, who were in World War II, but sat in an office and JFK uh, one thing that's interesting, he used his father's influence to see combat. Most people, yeah. many people, use their father's influence to avoid combat. To avoid he it. had an office job. He could have stayed in uh, kind of intelligence, but he wanted to see uh, action. Uh, and he, you know, he experienced action and lost two um, members of his crew. And so you, you say that his experience, you know, Ben Bradley was saying how exciting it was, how, you know, he was scared, but, you know, being in the Pacific was, uh, um, and then you uh, have this lovely quote from a Norwegian resistance fighter who writes, uh, the wars can bring adventures which stir the heart. The true nature of war is composed on innumerable personal tragedies of grief, waste, and sacrifice, wholly evil and not redeemed by glory. And it does yeah. seem to me that both the loss of his brother yeah. and the loss of these two crewmates, uh, one of whom almost had a premonition that he was going to die yeah, a day or two right. before they get hit. You know, it just, it has to stick with him. And then of course, some of those, when he's in the white house, they come and they, you know, uh, I think they're in the inaugural parade, you know, some of his crewmates and the, you know, it's, it sticks with him. Uh, you, you can't erase that kind of memory. It's, it totally sticks with him. And here, Tom, I, th I think that the letters are such a, such a treasure, the letters home, and you're familiar with many of these, I know, mm -hmm. That and maybe maybe some of these are digitized, maybe most of them. But anyhow, the letters that he writes um, from the Solomons, some of them to his former girlfriend Inga Arvad, uh, one of the great loves of his life, arguably the love of his life, at least until he met Jackie. Letters to her, letters to his family, to his sister Kick, uh, to his parents. They're they're really uh, for me at least highly revealing, and they go to this point that I think the, the romance of war wears off pretty quickly for him, mm -hmm. even before he has the PT-109 incident, the, the ramming by a Japanese destroyer. I think he says, this is, this, is, um, this is really terrible, what's going on? He does feel that the United States must prevail, um, but there isn't the kind of love for this that, as you say, Ben Bradley uh, later talked about. I loved every minute, uh, Bradley says right. in so many words. Right. Kennedy didn't have that. <clears throat> so let's talk about your second point of what he learned after the war, which is, again, <clears throat> there will be a post-war um, era. And here, too, he differs with his father. His father says uh, the Soviet Union, you know, you can trust them. There's no territorial ambitions yep. within the Democratic Party. You have... Uh, individuals like Henry Wallace saying, you know, uh, we can work with the Soviets, but he becomes a cold warrior. Um, yeah. wh where does that come from? Do you think? Well, how is he? Why is he instinctually um, suspicious I, of the Soviets? I think it's partly intellectual. That is to say, I think JFK, as a House, as a candidate for the House of Representatives, before I think the Cold War has really begun. Although everybody who's familiar with this can say can see in 1946 that there are deep tensions, that the Grand Alliance is now but a, a fading memory. And I think JFK honestly believes that Soviet expansionism is real, the Soviets have to be checked, uh, and we need to have a robust posture vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis the Kremlin. So part of this, part of the reason why I, I call him an original cold warrior is because he thinks it's the right thing to do. I also think, however, that he's a savvy young politician. Uh, even now, he, sh he understands, I think, that the smart political move for somebody who's a ambitious in American politics 
is to be on the right when it comes to foreign policy, when it comes to dealing with Moscow, with Soviet expansionism, and then after the Chinese communist win in China, it becomes a global thing. I think young JFK says to himself in so many words, you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to prosper as a politician if I'm hawkish, if I'm informed, uh, and if I stake out a position to the right of whoever my opponent is. So I think it's, I don't think that's primary. I think he genuinely believes in a, in a strong and hawkish foreign policy, but there is also that political benefit. And then let's move, let's take that same point and move from foreign policy to domestic policy because yeah. he, he does not have an admirable record uh, in dealing with McCarthyism. Explain no. that to us. No, I think it's, it's, um, it's a totally interesting part of the story to me. And I, there's a lot here I didn't know when I started my research. I did not understand, Tom, the depth of the friendship between Joe McCarthy and Joe Kennedy Sr. Um, I didn't understand that I knew about Robert Kennedy and the fact that he had worked for McCarthy and that they were tied to a degree. I didn't realize that there was that, that, the depth of that loyalty. Uh, I didn't, I think, fully understand the degree to which McCarthy had strong support in Massachusetts. Um, and so part of what Jack Kennedy is doing here is he's understanding there are a lot of votes to be lost and not enough to be gained if I come out in opposition to what McCarthy is doing. McCarthy's reign, if you will, begins in 1950. And I think for those years, 50 to 54, and I write about them, um, JFK bobs and weaves. He's very careful. I don't think, and I write about this, I don't think he's, uh, you know, I don't think he admires McCarthy. I think that, you know, JF, one of the things that JFK loves is, is decorum. He, he, he believes in the Senate sort of manners and graciousness. Uh, he believes in reason and, and arguing from reason. Um, McCarthy exhibits none of those things. So it's not that I think he admires McCarthy as a politician or wants to be like him, but he just thinks I'm not going to go out and challenge this guy. And when he fails to even register his position on the censure vote in, uh, in late 54, which he could have done, he could have instructed Sorensen to, to register his position in favor through a, a procedure called pairing. I think he would have saved himself a lot of grief from liberals in the party, including Mrs. Roosevelt and others, he chose not to do it. Right, because he loses that that other key constituency, kind of the moral and intellectual leaders of the party. Uh, I, I think so. Uh, he's yeah. not, to use the title of his later book, he's not really a profile in courage <laughs> on, on, on McCarthy, even though at the time, you could make an argument that in political, in strict, narrow political self-interest kind of terms, right. uh, it worked fine for him in Massachusetts. It was uh, interesting to me that uh, you just have a couple paragraphs about uh, a speech that Sorensen did prepare for him that was going to come out against McCarthy, yes. but it was never delivered. Um, That's right. Earlier in 54. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about a few other uh, key players in his life and in your book. So uh, Robert Kennedy. So um, first, as Allison mentioned in the introduction, he has that fascinating trip around the world where you yeah. suggest that's where he really gets to know his brother. I mean, he almost dies on that trip. So you certainly got to get to know your siblings when you're at this door. Um, but um, they didn't really know that one another growing up. There's eight and a half years difference. He's closer to his older brother, Joe. He's probably closest in sensibilities to his sister, Kick, uh, both of whom died during the war, right after the war. Lives for a while in DC with Eunice. He has a soft support for Rosemary, but Bobby's a bit unknown. Uh, yeah. So first he knows him through the campaigns because the campaign, the congressional campaign and the Senate campaigns, um, yeah. they're, they're a bit unwieldy and the father is having too large of an influence and who comes in and saves the day when you talk about uh, Bobby Kennedy's role in those campaigns. Oh, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, I think that trip, as you say, in 51, when they really spend a lot of time together, it's a long trip. They cover about 25,000 miles. It's the sort of excursion that no lawmaker would ever make today. Uh, you can be away for weeks and they were, uh, and they had the, the finances to, to be able to pull it off. And so they, they spend time together for the first time. And I think that trip really, um, and Patricia, who was also on the trip, she could see this, that her two brothers, 
just bonded in a way that they hadn't before. And then in 52, he had played a, as a young guy, he had, Bobby had played a minor role in the 46 campaign. Uh, actually, in some ways, kind of an important role in Cambridge. Uh, in the more Italian sections of Cambridge, he had gone door to door and actually played quite an important role in 46. But it's in 52 when this, this, this uh, Senate campaign is basically floundering that a 26-year-old Robert Kennedy comes on board, takes charge of the thing in a way that I think surprised people, and I argue in the book was actually really important in Jack's ultimate monster epic win against the supposedly unassailable Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. I don't think that, you know, it was such a close race, and I think we could probably chalk up the victory to any number of different things, but on that list is... Robert Kennedy's uh, management running of that campaign. And of course, in the years to come, uh, he's going to continue to be important, including, uh, needless to say, in 1960. And you talk about how, how in almost every campaign, they start earlier and they work harder than their competition. That's the secret. O I often think. underestimated. And uh, you know, Lodge was off vacationing and he comes back and realizes, you know, he's already a little bit behind. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, at one point I quote some some heavyweight Massachusetts politician who right. said, whoever opens a campaign office six months before an election, it's crazy. Right. Well, nobody ever yeah. said it was crazy after the Kennedys did. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so I learned a few things about Jacqueline Kennedy. I, I had not, not heard that, uh, I guess the details aren't fully known, but that he proposed to her over the phone while she's over in uh, Europe. Um, greets her when she comes back with the ring, but the proposal is actually over the phone. I felt for her in the story of her trying to play touch football and getting injured, you know what I mean? It just wasn't who she was. Um, no. And uh, she recognizes this, I had heard before, that, that marrying him is likely to lead to some pain and disappointment, but the aura of the life with him is, is worth the risk. Uh, and she's, you know, there's, attraction, affection. It's a complicated relationship that they have. Yeah, I think it is. I think there's real love there from the beginning, real attraction from the beginning on from from both of them. Um, uh, I think it's I think she did, as you say, understand on some level what she was getting into. Uh, she talked at several points about the fact that that her own father had cheated on her mother and some part of Jackie, I think, thought that this is what happens. This is what men do. When it then happened to her, I think it was much more difficult than she thought it was going to be. Uh, and I think there were difficult moments in the relationship from an early point. I don't think she quite, at least initially, could understand. Intellectually, I think she could understand what politics was about and what campaigning was about. But she had a hard time, I think, fitting into that, unlike JFK's sisters, they breathed right. politics, they lived right. politics. Right. They, for them, it was kind of second nature. I think it was much harder for her. Uh, he was not particularly sensitive to her. And yet you see moments in which there is real love. Uh, they had uh, more in common, I think, than maybe some authors have suggested. Lots mm -hmm. of uh, differences too, right. but um, right. it's complicated. Well, his first love really does seem to be politics and ambition and, um, you know, and he's married to that. And then, yeah. um, and he marries late, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's also often interesting and sweet to see the person she seems to have the most affection for is his father. Uh, and oh, yeah. he seems to understand her too. They have a fairly they, special bond. I think, I think she's closer to Joe than she is to anybody in the family other than Jack. Uh, and that's evident from an early point. I think it would be kind of surprising going in, but it's, it's true. They, they got each other in some way. They had long talks together uh, in, in Hyannisport. Um, and uh, I think it was harder for Jackie with the sisters. I think she had a kind of a more wary relationship with Rose though she wrote very lovely notes to her mother-in-law uh, <laughs> yeah. at various points. She had a real right, gift right. for that, so. Yeah, I don't wanna to be too cynical about it, but he also provides her with some financial resources that she yeah, needs and I talk to about fuel that. Yeah. various I, I, appetites. Uh, somebody, somebody I quote in the book, um, might've been Nancy Dickerson said, uh, or maybe Gore Vidal, somebody that I quote says, well, uh, 
you know, there are lots of handsome, uh, lots of handsome men in, in Washington, uh, young politicians. There just weren't as many with quite as much money as Jack Kennedy. And so, <laughs> you know, I don't think it, right. uh, it I don't want to suggest that it was, uh, no. right. you know, all important, but yes, it right. mattered. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I love your uh, metaphor of uh, Ted Sorensen as uh, Kennedy being the composer and Sorensen being the lyricist. Uh, they were the Rogers and Hart of politics. Uh, again, Sorensen, I think the thing you emphasize, he was 24 years old. He's just out of law school from Nebraska. He doesn't have the world experience that JFK does, but he has an uncanny ability to find just the right oh. historical illusion that JFK needs. It's a wonderful partnership that they have. Oh, yeah. And I, I think it's just astonishing. And I could have written much more about this, but you know, a, a long book was getting longer, but I do think it is one of the most remarkable political partnerships, certainly in the modern history of the country. And they just clicked uh, from the beginning. And, you know, I suggest that it's not just Sorensen's ability at mimicry. Uh, it's more than that, that he is able in a way that I think is quite exceptional to articulate on the printed page for Kennedy, what Kennedy had initially instructed that he would do, but right, right, Sorensen right. brings his own uh, uh, yeah. skill to this. Sorensen is that rare figure, I suggest, who not only is involved in policy, but also then can, can articulate that policy in a very powerful way on the printed page. They never socialized, by the way, or very seldom. Yeah. It's, it's a yeah. professional relationship, right. but it, in that regard, it couldn't be closer than it was. You know, I uh, had the great honor of getting to know Ted Sorensen. He spoke at the library mm. seven or eight times. And um, uh, I like your words that it's hard to determine who had produced what. And people were yeah. always asking, you know, who came up with this line. But it was there was just a synergy between them. And JFK might have said it on the airplane and then, and then Sorensen jotted it yeah. down. It's hard to, you know, especially the ask not quote or others. You know, it's just hard to know. Uh, or to give credit, and we won't go into the profile and courage um, controversy, but you know it's hard to credit who did what. They really were an incredible team. Yeah, uh, I'll just I'll just say before you continue that even on that book, uh, that partnership, and I think I lay this out in the book, that partnership is real. Uh, right. JFK's own role in the in the production of that book, in coming up with the themes, the arguments, the introduction, the conclusion, very much JFK there. But as you also say, um, Sorensen Sorensen's right. role is immense, and finances play a role there too, because I think there's a non-disclosure agreement. But Sorensen was well compensated for his role yes. in writing the book, as you know, yeah. part of the. Uh, so the other, uh, I have a few overarching questions, but the other person that I found interesting at the end of the book was his relationship with Adlai Stevenson. Um, yeah. I don't think we want to go into the whole uh, opening of the convention, but uh, it was interesting to me how RFK followed Stevenson around yeah. um, to, to watch and was that actually fairly unimpressed with how Stevenson ran his campaign, but yeah. RFK is learning in 56 for what's to come in 60. Um, and then I don't want to get into volume two, but I just read this interesting article in the New Yorker that uh, I mean, I certainly knew of Stevenson's role in the Cuban Missile Crisis, and uh, now Marty Sherwin's arguing it was an even larger role than we might have known. But anyway, talk about the differences. You you, you mentioned that uh, JFK shared Stevenson's affinity for blending poetry and power, uh, but they're two very different men, two di yeah. different leaders of their party. Yeah, they are. I think that in the period that I'm writing about in this volume, uh, so up through the end of 56, they have a pretty good relationship. The letters between them uh, are more affectionate than I maybe would have expected. I don't think it's just boilerplate language between two ambitious politicians. I think they were actually um, they were actually on good terms. I think that will shift, needless to say, uh, and it becomes a much more contentious relationship as I will write about in volume two. But yeah, there is. Um, there is on the part of both of them uh, an interest in the written word, uh, an interest in um, intellectual pursuits. Ironically, Jack was by far the more dedicated reader than mm -hmm. was Adlai Stevenson. Uh, mm -hmm. Stevenson actually didn't like to read uh, all that huh. much. He came off as somebody right. who was very much uh, cerebral in that sense. Head. But yeah, yeah. but uh, it was much more, I think, JFK that way. But, uh, you know, they could have been, as you alluded to, they could have been running mates. It was probably very much to Jack Kennedy's uh, mm -hmm. fortune uh, 
that he narrowly lost that uh, that race for second spot on the ticket. But just also, since you alluded to it, Bobby Kennedy following Stevenson on the campaign trail that fall, 56, and being, for the most part, singularly unimpressed yeah. by what Stevenson did. And he was taking notes, what to do next time if we're running, and more importantly, maybe what not to do next time. So unimpressed that you suggest um, that uh, Bobby voted for Eisenhower, which is, yeah. I guess, something that I certainly didn't know. Passed a quiet vote for, for the Republican <laughs> incumbent. Uh, so let me close with a couple of overarching questions. Again, we welcome any from the audience. Um, so I open with Christopher Lydon's metaphor of, uh, you know, falling for an old flame. And I want to end uh, one question about, uh, you know, the danger of romanticizing JFK. And yeah. uh, you, I mean, first is this, he, he does it himself. You uh, mentioned that when he's um, flying across the Pacific, he reads John Buchan's memoir, Pilgrim's Way which is about uh, one person in there is Raymond Asquith, um, who, whose father was prime minister in Britain, and he dies uh, in the Battle of the Somme in 1916. And there's this quote, quote, there are some men whose brilliance in boyhood and early manhood dazzles their contemporaries and becomes a legend. It's not that they're precocious for precocity rarely charms, but that for every sphere of life, they have the proper complements of gifts and finish each stage so that it remains behind them like a satisfying work of art. And Sorensen, uh, who writes, you know, the first big biography of Kennedy um, after his death in the wake of his tragic death, um, you know, quotes that book and others. So there is this sense of hagiography about JFK. How, how as a biographer do you cut through that? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a challenge. I mean, mine is a sympathetic portrayal, as you know, Tom, um, though, as I suggest in the preface, and I think this will be important for me also in volume two, maybe more important, is I think it's incumbent upon me as a biographer to try to look him straight in the eye, not up in veneration, not down in condescension. Um, and I think that's, that's a challenge, um, you know, or at least um, I, th I think it's a, it's a, I hope and believe it's a challenge that I can, that I can overcome. And the way to do it, it seems to me, is to look very closely at the, the archival record, rely on original sources as much as I can, try to recreate the world in which Kennedy and others lived, um, call a spade a spade when, when I think he makes mistakes, which he certainly does, both as a politician and in his private life. I think it's incumbent upon me to, to point that out. And then to see where what we find. I think that... Um, I do think that um, JFK um, was an, imp an extraordinary figure in the 20th century, and an extraordinary uh, American political figure. Uh, and I think we can learn a great deal from his half century of, 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 of life at this, this incredible moment, the, the making of the American century. But uh, I think you're right to draw attention to the danger that exists, maybe especially with a figure like this. Maybe in that respect, Tom, he's kind of unique, uh, in, at least in the modern history of the country. Um, easy to romanticize, no question. Uh, you know, one way to critique him is that he's almost too much of an individualist and it's too much about JFK and his own ambition. And yeah. there uh, was refreshing again to read The Housemaster at Choke who says, you know, again, this is when he's in high school, obviously, yeah. he's a complete individualist. Um, and he's hopeful that over time, his young charge would learn to distinguish between liberty and license. His headmaster says he has a clever individualist mind. It's, har it's a harder mind to put a harness on than his brothers. And as a sailor, he developed a reputation for boldness and cunning and catching his opponents by surprise. So he succeeds in the game of politics, but, yeah. and, and, and then he does, bring the country to higher goals. But there are other times when it just seems it's all about him. Is that a fair? Yeah, I think, I, I think that is fair. Um, I do sometimes, I think I wouldn't disagree with anything you've said. I do think though that one of the reasons for his legacy, and we often wonder, we often think, you know, is it, is it the glamor of the White House? Is it his soaring speech making? Is it the circumstances of his death? that were captured on film 
I think one of the more re important reasons for his legacy is that he does remind us of an age when it was possible to believe that politics could, could speak to society's highest aspirations, that politics could help solve real problems. And the sense of idealism in the inaugural address, which by the way, I suggest there are themes in that inaugural address that really go back to the beginning of his political career. Uh, and so, and those are speeches early on that as you know, he wrote himself. So I think that that idealism transcends that individualism that you refer to. And I do think that you're right. There are times when it's, when it's very much about him, but not other times. And I don't think it accounts for his legacy and for the fact that he looms so large in the minds of at least um, a certain generation of Americans. I don't know how that sounds yeah. to you. Yeah, and, uh, <clears throat> I usually at the end of a forum have a quote or two, and I'm going to use that same quote, but he elevated America's belief in the capacity of politics to solve big problems. And I, I yeah. agree that that's what redeems him. Um, uh, let me ask two maybe final questions. Uh, so you leave us with this delicious moment. Um, I mean, the election of 56 has just ended and yeah. then he's uh, already telling his uh, team, you know, what, what they need to do. They need to get all the names of everyone who attended the 56 convention because he's going to visit them in the next four years. Uh, he says, we got to be all in. We can't just focus on voters. We got to focus on the party leaders. And then he has this memorable conversation with his father after their Thanksgiving meal. Mm -hmm. Just why don't you recount that for us? Uh, I just, I, I think, you know, it may be apocryphal, but I do have uh, two or three sources that, that support what transpired. They have a conversation um, at Thanksgiving in Hyannisport, 1956. So uh, uh, Stevenson has gone down to a decisive defeat. It's a landslide for, for Eisenhower. Jack Kennedy is an emerging star, uh, partly because of the con convention earlier in the summer. And they have spent, I think, weeks leading up to this point thinking about things. And now here at Thanksgiving, they have this conversation. And Jack, perhaps honestly, perhaps you know, not, lays out all the reasons why he shouldn't run. And his father lays out the reasons why he should run in 1960. And it ends with... Uh, Jack saying to his father, well, dad, I guess the only question is, when do we start? And that's where the book, um, that's where this first volume uh, draws to a close. And I imagine you've started on volume two. Have you made much progress in any sense? Of I, I have in, uh, you know, I have it outlined. Uh, I, it's going to, it's interesting. The first book covers 39 years and the second volume will cover only seven mm -hmm. uh, because of course it's the, it's the, it's the race for the presidency. And here too, Tom, as you said earlier, he starts earlier and works harder than the competition. I think that's key even in 60 with respect to the, to the Democratic, Democratic nomination. But it's the race for the presidency, it's the presidency itself, and then of course the assassination. I have outlined it. I have um, done a significant amount of research. Uh, I have a lot already on foreign policy and especially Vietnam since his Vietnam policy I've written about at some length before. But as you and I were saying before we started, uh, all of us who work as historians were desperate for archives to, to reopen. And so in particular, the Kennedy Library, which is just such a treasure, so important for all of us. Uh, I can't wait to get back into the Kennedy Library and other archives so I can really uh, start to make you know, good progress on this. Right. Uh, so I thought I'd end with two quotes. One's JFK was a new one to me, and it was before he met Sorensen. So uh, 1952, he's running for the Senate. He was debating Henry Cabot Lodge at an overflow crowd at South Junior High School in Waltham, which I um, Googled is just about 10 miles from here. But it's just amazing to think of them you know, debating <laughs> in a small little junior high. Uh, and JFK warns that we not look at history, quote, through the trick binoculars of hindsight, which makes all things easy and all men wise. I'd never heard that line, the trick binoculars of hindsight, but at the opening, Fred, I praised your book, um, which gives a balanced and nuanced view. You don't fall prey to the trick binoculars of hindsight here. Um, and I wanted to end with the, these two quotes, one of which is the one that you just used uh, earlier, that through uh, John F. Kennedy's magnetic personality and inspirational rhetoric, 
He elevated America's belief in the capacity of politics to solve big problems and speak to society's highest aspirations. While in foreign affairs, he showed it was possible to move from bitter hostility toward the Soviet Union to coexistence. His command of policy, his international experience, his winning personality, his telegenic looks, all of it came together in a formidable package. So let me thank everyone who joined us uh, this evening. Uh, thank Allison for producing tonight's forum. Thank you again, Fred, for joining us tonight and for this wonderful new biography, which again is available at the Concord Bookshop. Um, I think it's fitting to pause one week uh, before the election to look at a 20th century president. So in one week's time, the country will cast its ballots to determine if we'll elect our second Catholic as a president or if we need to wait another four years before knowing who the 46th president of the United States may be. I thank you all